Hey everybody, welcome to the new Grand Caliber channel. My name is Marco Nicolini. My name is Nick Arnold. And this channel is going to be geared for the watch enthusiasts where we post new videos every week discussing watches. So follow us along. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell for us. And again, we'd love to see those comments. So let's get started. So today's video, we're talking about the five most significant watches of all time as voted by members of our office. I do not particularly agree with all of the choices on this list. Well, yeah, there's definitely some that are well-deserved on this list, but like Nick said, there's definitely some that are not deserved, but we're gonna go through them and we'll let you guys decide as well. Before we get started, today's sponsor of this video is Aaron Bespoke. He is my personal favorite strap maker, uh, so wait till the end of the video to find out how you can win this custom watch roll. Coming in at number five is the first of these watches that was created, hailing all the way back to 1917, which is the Cartier tank. This watch was designed shortly after World War I, and it was actually designed based on the French tanks from World War I from Renault. They were designed after, I see this is stuff I didn't even know. So you're telling me this watch was designed after a military tank. Did you actually not know that? I did not know that. I can't get over this. Did you like? Did you really not know that this was designed after a tank? I did not actually know. So you never, you never once looked at this watch and said that looks like a tank. But like, where are the guns and the, like, <laughs> where's the missile come out? Like, I, this doesn't look like a tank to me. It looks like a TV. It's got the gun on the side there. What most people don't know, they associate tool watches with James Bond and the Rolex Submariner, the early Submariners that Q would give him that were equipped with all these kind of tools. But what they don't know is that the early Cartier tanks were actually designed with weaponry as well to pay true homage to the French tank. I would say that the way that I place this watch in the world of horology is very similar to the Rolex Day-Date or the Rolex President as, as it has become affectionately known. This is a watch that you see on the wrists of important political figures, world leaders, or royal family members such as Princess Diana. Even rappers like Jay-Z has definitely been seen wearing this watch on numerous occasions. So it's, I mean, it's, it's a design that's not gonna go anywhere anytime soon. I mean, it's a classic, you know, timeless design. It'll always look good. It is the perfect suit and tie watch in my opinion. You know, if that's your style, this is definitely the watch to wear to like, you know, important events, weddings, so forth. It's really, you know, it'll always make a statement wherever it goes. What are we selling this watch for? I might, I might just, just. <laughs> He's gonna buy it off the show. This is a QVC watch dealing to ourselves <laughs> where you are not this the actually, <laughs> This is staying on my left wrist now. Oh my God. Put it back. Invoice me after this video. All right. So next watch on the list, and this is probably the closest. You know, it's a chronograph. As you guys know, I love I love chronograph watches, and that is going to be the Omega Speedmaster. This definitely makes the list because it has very strong historical significance. I know you guys out there don't need this beaten into your head, but it is the first watch to go on the moon. NASA rigorously tested this watch through high pressure you know, freezing temperatures. They tested every aspect of this watch and it just kept ticking. Anyways, it definitely deserved a spot on Buzz Aldrin's wrist when he landed on the moon and it officially became the first watch on the moon. And Omega is just a company that will not let you forget this. And they've created numerous models around that fact. The Ed White is now reintroduced back into the market with the actual 321 movement, which is amazing to see like you would, that's almost like as if Rolex resurrected the 1570 caliber into a modern watch. We would probably lose our minds because one, 1570 is a non-quick movement. So we're going backwards, but for Omega, they can do it because it's simply a chronograph. So that doesn't really change. So chronographs are chronographs are chronographs. So I, I will say, I mean, I personally, did not find the Speedmaster a watch that was deserving of being on this list. But I actually did not know that NASA tested, like all jokes they really, aside, they, yeah, they I didn't know they actually tested the watch to go to the moon. But I think that one thing that stands out for Omega is they embrace the heritage of their brand. It's like you could not pay Rolex enough money. We could offer them a trillion dollars and they would not entertain their vintage audience. If you want a vintage watch, you're gonna have to go after true vintage watches. Oh, yeah. They don't make modern homage watches to their vintage stuff, like you said with the 1520. I mean, hopefully you're going no date, I mean, because if you have to set it yourself, then nobody's gonna buy it. I mean, but, let alone they haven't really changed the design of this watch much at all. Fair, which you know could I mean? be said for some other watches on this list. Actually, people don't know this, but Daytonas were actually designed to race 
to the moon. Like they just didn't win the race. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Rolex designed the Daytona in where they were trying to get NASA. They were trying to compete? They were trying to get the Daytona on the moon. It just didn't happen. Interesting. Well, it's interesting because as, as I look at this the one. The Cosmograph. Like you got to think that's. I guess that makes a, I, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> These are just things you don't think about. We're focused on dial variations, not what the words mean. Yeah. Think about it. You're using a cosmograph to time lap times. And they're like, I think we're just better suited here. Yeah, we're better suited here. <laughs> we'll just go to NASCAR. Yeah, pretty much at Daytona. Coming in at third on the list is another extremely important watch, the Patek Philippe Nautilus. This is not only a significant watch, but it also is associated with a very significant watch designer. Gerald Genta. Wait, Gerald Genta? Gerald he's a, he's Genta. He's a watch dealer on 47th, right? I think I've done a deal or two with him. And I, I'm pretty sure he left me hanging on one deal. Like, he broke Mazal. Gerald Genta. I know I've definitely heard that name somewhere. You've definitely heard it somewhere. I don't know Figure if 47th out. is where he's hanging out. It's not on 47th? No, he's like Siegel, Upper East Side. Siebel building? Upper okay. East Side, for sure. Okay. <laughs> so what most people may not know about this watch is the original design was sketched on a napkin while he was looking at Patek Philippe customers in Geneva. Interesting. So this was another pretty controversial decision by a major watchmaker, whereas before the Nautilus, Patek really did not have anything that was in the sports watch space. It was all extremely traditional dress watches. And so it's kind of similar to how Cartier did with the tank, but they made a big change. I will have to say, I'll give it to them because even back then before, before Gerard Genta really designed the Nautilus, I mean, in, in today's world, they were putting out some bankers like those, you know, 1518s, like the, the perpetual calendar, yeah, the perpetual calendar game they had back then was just amazing like you couldn't really compete with them when it came to perpetual counters it was like but that was their game like that was that forte was like making those dress watches yeah know? and they, they took a huge pivot and they copied another watch that is on this list uh when they saw the rise and success of that they realized that the market is kind of like the pre quartz crisis right like you're seeing before the quartz crisis, you've got the sports crisis where right. everybody's starting to wear watches with bracelets now right. and they're going in the sports watch direction. True. So he designed this based off of the ship, or it was named after the ship from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, but he designed it based off of the porthole on a ship. Uh, which I find pretty interesting. For number two, we have the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak, which as you guys also know, was designed by Gerald Genta. And similar story to what Nick said, um, you know, apparently, and this is hearsay, I don't know if it's true or, you know, or false, but there's, uh, you know, it is hearsay, but basically he was, you know, at a lake in Switzerland, just doing what Gerald Genta does, just sits around and thinks about watches and thinks about design when he noticed a scuba diver coming up they were apparently repairing something you know that involved scuba divers but when the scuba divers came up he noticed that their helmet the you know, scuba masks uh or you know the classic ones that you've seen from the, like the rolex submariner brochures or so forth but they have those like see-through ports and they have the screws yeah. so he saw the screws that were holding on the you know the glass panel on the scuba mask and he and he got the design idea to put that on the Audemars Speedgate Royal Oaks. So that's why you have those screws holding on the bezel because it was inspired by a scuba diver mask, which is, again, that's very interesting. But yeah, so the you know the Royal Oak also, interestingly enough, you know, in the early 70s, um, was one of the very first watches to entirely use stainless steel. Interesting. So, yeah. So they're like, and I'm talking like high quality stainless, like 316s. Yeah, like not. Yeah, because like before that, a lot of watchmakers were using like your watch, it was two tone or it was gold. Like they use a lot of gold parts in these watches too. But I mean, they went entirely stainless steel. And um, yeah, I mean, Rolex was definitely not making all stainless steel Submariners for 30 years before that. And so like Rolex subs were the tool watches. Like they were yeah. used, you know, in, you know, in retrospect, they were used to be on the wrist of the diver that was diving in the lake that Gerald Genta saw. So like <laughs> that guy was probably wearing a Submariner 5513 and Gerald Genta was like, hmm, he's got a watch on, but he's got a very interesting, you know, mask on too. So he designed the Royal Oak to kind of mimic that, yeah. which gave it like, you know, which gave it an extremely famous look now to which AP has not, you know, strayed away from that look at yeah. all. No, I mean, it's interesting too, like you see both with the Nautilus as well as the Royal Oak. I mean, they had the integrated bracelets, which was very different at the True. time. The like, that is totally a Gerald, uh, Gerald Genta design is the integrated bracelets. That's one thing you'll o always notice with his watches. He loves integrating that design into everything he does. And the big reveal, the number one most significant watch of all time. Oh my God. 
The Rolex of Mariner. <laughs> wow. Um, is it the Rolex of Mariner though? So, I mean, it was introduced in 1953 with the 6204, and that's the earliest iteration of the Submariner. And what I think is very fascinating is 59 comes along, and then you've got the 5512. And then you've got movement changes, and eventually they add a date. But that design stays the same up until Sapphire Crystal in the 80s, and then the design really stayed the same. All you did is change the crystal. And then in 2007, you changed to ceramic insert. But for 1959 to 2023, this watch has hardly changed in the DNA at all. Yeah, of course, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll just say this, like the 6200 is probably my favorite sub ever. The King. <laughs> it is called The King. Um, and I think it's called that for a reason. I mean, just like how enormous the crown sits on that case and like, the way they printed the dolls like it's just so different and there's been arguments out there like which came it's like chicken or the egg with that watch i know like there was like controversy about like one had an earlier serial number than the other but the production dates are like flipped yeah so what's well, interesting weird. like when i was refreshing myself just to make sure i'm not looking like an idiot on the internet it happens i looked it up i was like what is a versa mariner reference and it said 6204 and i was like what are you talking about it's the 6200 that's what i thought and then like there's arguments online that like the 6204s have earlier production numbers so of course if you go by the book it's gonna say that's the first but what people recall was like the basil fair you know you know i guess their version of the basil world showed the 6200 as the very first Submariner. Like that was what was first sold and then the 6204. Interesting. I think one of the biggest keynote, you know, evolution points on this watch is the fact that they added a click spring after so long. Like you have to ask yourself why that wasn't designed sooner. Because if you're a diver and it's actually your tool, the last thing you want to do is like hit your bezel up on something and lose time on your oxygen tank and then suffocate down there. Yeah, I think we need to go look through Swiss legal records and figure out if, if Rolex was ever sued by divers in the in the 50s before the click spring was added. And, yeah, and it's, just, it's amazing the, from like the birth of the watch to the click spring. That's always- It took over 20 years. That's a long time. If you had to pick, you have unlimited budget. Comics. What is your dream sub? What's my dream sub? A 6200. The 6200? Oh yeah, I'd have that over a comics. But it's like the last, okay, I saw a 6200 at one of the trade shows and they were asking half a million dollars for it. And I was like, listen, it's a sub. But, <laughs> you know, I understand how much you love your watch, but damn, you know, like 6200 is, but they're, you know, I, are they worth it? Probably to the right buyers. I mean, like if you have that kind of money to spend half a million on a Submariner, money's no object. You know, everything's coming down in a sense, but I mean, everything is also leveling out. So, I mean, you know, they're, at the end of the day, their watches, they can only go down so much. I mean, this isn't a world where we see watches go to zero. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> start it's still, shoveling them out, you know. At the very least, we could scrap it for steel weight and, True. and get like, you know, it's like aluminum Coke cans. It says like, hi, I'm five cents on the back. Like we could just start getting stickers and putting them on case backs. You should like, get that engraved on hi, the back. Hi, I'm $10. I, I will. Okay got the guy. Okay, as we wrap this up, guys, we have one more as an honorable mention, and that is the Rolex Daytona. For me, this made the list because this is a watch that was so heavily disregarded through the 70s and 80s and almost into the 90s and became so coveted among collectors and dealers worldwide. And you know, what's really, really interesting about the Daytona is it's truly evolved um, from just a measly ma manual line watch to having platinum models with Arabic dials, which are just Again, insane. You know, now they're very coveted. And you know, also another cool thing about Rolex and Daytonas is for most of their life, they didn't even have a Rolex movement in them. You know, they had a Valjo or a Zenith El Primero movement that was, you know, redefined for Rolex's use. So very cool on that note. And um, I'll pass this over to you. As mentioned in the beginning of the video, thank you to Aaron Bespoke for sponsoring this video. And for those of you watching, if you wanna win this watch roll, comment your five most significant watches of all time below, and we will be picking one random winner in next week's video, and we will reach out to you for your shipping information. Right, thank you guys for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell for our new channel. And until then, we'll see you next time.